Hello, and welcome to the Sea Science Symposium. We are the Climate Disaster Preparedness Team, and during our research internship, we worked on visualizing climate disaster impacts on Texas and Australia from 2000 to 2022 so that we can predict future disasters. Hi, my name is Gia Gill. I'm from San Jose, California, and I'm interested in computer science. Hi, I'm Helen Lee, and I'm from Swanee, Georgia, and I'm interested in earth and environmental sciences. Hi, I'm Sriman Narasimhan, and I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I'm interested in a career in computer and environmental sciences. Hello, my name is Shruti Natala, and I'm from San Diego, California, and I'm interested in studying computer science. Hey everyone, my name is Matthew Noriega. I'm from Houston, Texas, and I have an interest in statistics and business analytics. Hi, my name is Ethan Palash. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I'm interested in computer engineering. Hi, I'm Katherine Sullivan. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I'm interested in computer science. Hi, I'm Anita Thokadam. I'm from Plainsboro, New Jersey, and I'm interested in computer science and earth science. Here's a quick overview of what we'll be going over in this presentation. Let's dive right in. So what is remote sensing? Remote sensing is collecting data about our planet while observing it from space. While ground observations rely on human input and are limited in area, remote sensing allows for global coverage by observing from space. Passive satellites, such as the Landsat pictured in the right of this slide, detect the wavelength and magnitude of light waves emitted from the surface. Based on where the waves fall on the electromagnetic spectrum, conclusions can be drawn on the type of surface in that area. The satellites we use in our research are shown on this slide. We utilize a range of passive and active satellites in our research. In order to map raw data accessed through Google Earth Engine, we utilize Python and Google Colab to access the datasets, stratify them, and display them in unique ways. First, we used a series of statements to import the datasets and create an image collection, which includes all points of data in a given date range. Then, we used a series of statements to reduce the collection by averaging images, selecting specific ones, or performing operations between two images to produce a product. Then, we defined parameters such as a color palette and numerical range and mapped the data. This is just the basic mapping process, but more complicated tasks were done in order to create time-lapse GIFs and integrate multiple datasets to create a risk map. In, in addition to mapping with GEE, we utilize libraries like Pandas to create time series graphs. Let's talk about some of the ways that we utilize Google Earth Engine to conduct our research. This animation shows surface temperatures of the Pacific Ocean as shared through the NOAA dataset with data collected by the Pathfinder satellite. It shows a natural circulation process called upwelling, which is where warm water is pushed aside by powerful winds, allowing cooler waters to circulate upwards. El Nino and La Nina are events that break this typical cycle. We map them in order to track their intensity and effect on precipitation and drought in the context of our target areas, Texas and Australia. These two maps represent the anomaly in ocean surface temperature leading to an El Nino or La Nina event. Each calculate an average of ocean surface temperature over 10 years leading to the event and find the difference between that and the event year, forming a visual representation of the difference from average conditions. The map to the left shows the 2015 to 2016 El Nino, mapped by our group with visible Pacific warming around the equator. The map on the right shows the intense 1998 to 1999 La Nina event with clear surface cooling in the Pacific around the equator. The effects of El Nino and La Nina are significant across the continents adjacent to the Pacific Ocean and bring severe climate shifts like shown on the slide in North America. Currently, we are in a La Nina period in 2022 and 2023, and satellite data released in the near future can give insight to the severity of the event happening now and how it may affect the climate. The important thing to note is that El Nino and La Nina are the linking factor between climate changes in a Texas and Australia, which are inversely related. Understanding how it affects each of these areas can enable us to make accurate assessments of risks such as wildfires and floods in a given area. Texas and Australia are at opposite ends of the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon. This means that it is highly likely that Texas and Australia have related responses to El Nino and La Nina. So, we focused on them to shed more light on the relationship between the weather patterns of these two regions. La Nina pushes typical weather conditions to an intense extreme. For example, during the 2011 La Nina, Texas dealt with drought and wildfire conditions, while Australia saw high records of precipitation and flash flooding. So there's an inverse relationship. 
Looking into both these regions has helped us understand that floods and droughts are not mutually exclusive phenomena. We learned that both are dynamic events that occur in parallel and are affected by many of the same climate-driven factors. And ultimately, as you can see from the diagram, all of these climate disaster impacts are deeply interconnected, and our curiosity about the way that they interplay has led us to choose Texas and Australia as our two subjects for our research. The MODIS sensor on Terra measures land surface temperature daily. Here, we have graphed this data for the past 22 years, along with the mean temperatures for each region. These GIFs give a more visual depiction of land surface temperature. This GIF includes 2011, an El Nino year. You can see that when Australia's land surface temperature is colder, or more purple, Texas becomes warmer, or redder. The phenomenon causes opposite extremes for each region. We continued our investigation by looking at wildfires, which have reached record levels both in Texas and Australia. As of this summer, there are 12 active wildfires in Texas, and 99% of the state is experiencing some form of drought. In Australia, the bushfire season has grown by nearly a month in the last four decades, and fire events are only becoming more extreme. The GIFs on the screen represent burned area over time in both locations from 2000 to 2021. They show that West, North, and South Texas have experienced most of the state's extreme wildfire, and that in Australia, most fire events take place up north. One key thing to note here is that places that aren't experiencing as much wildfire tend to be more densely populated, so that would include East Texas and the lower half of Australia. Burned area has greatly increased in both locations, which was evident when we compared maps from 2000 with those from 2021 for Texas, and as you can see here for Australia. Next, we have a graph of total burned area over time, which allows us to see the burn data for specific years. One thing that was immediately apparent to us was that 2011 had an especially bad wildfire season in both locations, which was consistent with the record land surface temperatures that were recorded for that year. On that note, looking at the drought maps for 2010 and 2011, you can see the increase in drought levels that occurred in central Texas. And for Australia, drought extended much further east over the course of that year. Similarly, the burned area maps show a much greater burned area than those from adjacent years. Texas was hit hard from the beginning of the year, as shown by the volume of lighter points on the map, while Australia's wildfire season intensified in September, which is why there is a large number of orange and red pixels on the map. So, apart from observing overall changes in burned area for both locations, we also wanted to know which parts of Texas and Australia had been most affected by wildfire over the last 20 years. To figure that out, we split the territories into ecoregions and calculated the average number of square kilometers burned in each ecoregion between 2000 and 2021. In Texas, the areas with the highest average burned area were the western Gulf Coastal Plain, which is down south, the southwestern Tablelands up north, and the Edwards Plateau in central Texas. In Australia, which has nearly 40 ecoregions, the top three were the Kimberley Tropical Savanna, the Great Sandy Tanami Desert, and the Carpentaria Tropical Savanna, which are all in North Australia. Next, let's talk about vegetation. Specifically, we can measure it with the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI for short. Essentially, it's a numerical representation of the vegetative health of a region, where higher values correlate with greener vegetation. It ranges from negative 1 to 1, and negative values show that the plants are dead or inanimate, we have low values for unhealthy plants and high values for optimally healthy plants. With this in mind, we can take a look to the right, where I created a graph that shows the relationship between Texan and Australian NDVI over the past 20 years. As we noted earlier, there's an inverse relationship between these climate disaster impacts. So whenever Texas NDVI is decreasing, Australian NDVI is increasing. That trend takes hold massively here, but it's important to note that it converges in 2001, 2011, and we can see it beginning to converge again as we approach the 2022 through 2023 La Nina phenomenon. So this shows that there's a trend of convergence in the La Nina years, and that's going to help us make predictions moving forward into this next season. And if you found that interesting, here's a GIF of the graph in the last slide where you can see the patterns play out visually over time. Another important aspect of land to consider is surface soil moisture, which is also known as SSM. SSM is the total amount of water, including water vapor in an unsaturated soil. I use the NASA USDA enhanced SMAP global soil moisture dataset to generate soil moisture maps on Google Earth Engine, like this map of Texas. Soil moisture levels are important indicators of drought, 
as low levels are a sign of a risk for depleted soil moisture that may eventually lead to plants not maturing to their potential or permanently wilting and dying. Over the past few years, soil moisture levels have drastically decreased, as can be seen by these two visualizations. Through analyzing SMAP data, I discovered that as a result of the current La Nina pattern, in late 2021, soil moisture levels took a plunge and left Texas much drier than normal. Because of the soil moisture trends we visualized, we can predict that these levels will continue to decrease through the end of 2022, and that northern regions of Texas are more at risk for drought. Humidity, the measure of moisture in the air, can also be used as an indicator for drought and fire risk. There are two ways that one can measure humidity, relative and specific humidity. Relative humidity is a percentage of water that air can hold at one particular moment at a specific temperature. Specific humidity is a ratio of water to surrounding air. While the relative humidity is most commonly used to observe weather, specific humidity can also be used for a similar purpose. This came in use during my research as there was not always a reliable data set that represented relative humidity for the areas I wanted to cover. By using relative max humidity data on Texas during El Nino and La Nina years, we can observe that Texas is more moist in the east during El Nino years, leading to more severe hurricanes. During La Nina years, like this year and last year, Texas appears drier, which explains why the majority of the state is currently experiencing a drought. For Australia, due to the lack of reliable relative humidity data, I used specific humidity to analyze how much humidity was present. In 2016 to 2017, El Nino years, Australia appears more brown and thereby more dry. In 2020 to 2021, La Nina years, Australia appears more white and thereby more moist. This displays the inverse relationship Australia holds with Texas and their humidity during El Nino and La Nina years. Precipitation is an important indicator of global hurricane severity, giving us a measurement that we can use to analyze disasters like Hurricane Harvey in Texas, for example. Record high precipitation as part of tropical storms can cause flooding, while dry spells with low rainfall can cause drought. For our project, we looked at precipitation in Texas and Australia by using the Global Precipitation Measurement IMERG dataset, which dates back to 2000. We focused on precipitation measurements during hurricane and flooding seasons from 2017 to 2020, which happened to be a period of intense hurricane activity due to factors like the ongoing La Nina and global warming. As shown in these precipitation maps of Texas, precipitation was at record high levels in the Atlantic Gulf of Mexico region, correlating with high hurricane activity. We also mapped precipitation in Australia during the same period. Australia has various biomes, and as shown, its northern forest biome receives more average rainfall, while its southern desert biome is dry and more prone to drought. Here we see that in the north, the northern Australia is more prone to flooding and those sorts of impacts, while the south is more prone to drought-related issues like wildfires. In 2019 to 2020 in particular, there was a sudden drop in precipitation in the southern region, which led to intense wildfire activity. We also mapped precipitation in both Texas and Australia, as shown in this line chart, and this was in the year of 2017. We also mapped precipitation in five La Nina and heavy rainfall years between 2005 and 2021. Over time, we saw that precipitation in Texas has been increasing during hurricane season, which tends to be from around June to September. Meanwhile, precipitation has been at record lows during Australia's dry season from May to October. Using our analysis and current observations from the current 2022 La Nina, we can predict that these precipitation trends will continue, leading to increased flooding risk in eastern Texas and drought risk throughout parts of Australia. Flooding connects to humidity, soil moisture, and precipitation. Severe flooding is caused by atmospheric conditions that lead to heavy rain or the rapid melting of snow and ice. Geography can also make an area more likely to flood. For example, areas near rivers and cities are often at risk for flash floods. Different situations that can cause floods include heavy rain as mentioned by Shreema, storm surges, melting snow or ice, and dams or levees breaking. Using the Global Flood Database, which dates from 2000 to 2018, I mapped the flooded areas of Texas in the year of 2016. Although precipitation was at high levels due to severe hurricane activity in the 2017 La Nina, 
I found the global flood database to be an incomplete data set, which could possibly be because of the cloud coverings during the extreme storm events. The brown color on the map represents the study area and the red colors on the map represent the maximum ex extent of flood water during the event, which in is the 2016 Atlantic hurricane season in this case. The heavy flooded areas on the east coast and northeastern Texas correlate with the heavy rains of the period and with the high soil moisture and precipitation towards eastern Texas. In the same way, the, gold, the global flood database was used to find heavy affected areas in Australia. This time, a one-month period of March 2017 was examined due to its severe tropical storm period and high impact with the number of people displaced and the number of casualties. The coast of eastern Australia has a great flood extent as shown by the red coloring on the map. This also correlates with the high humidity on the eastern coast of Australia as shown by Shruti in the previous slides. High surface soil moisture levels increase the risk of flooding, especially in regions that experience more rain. On the left is a visualization of average surface soil moisture in Australia in 2020, and the black outlines highlight different ecoregions, which are areas where ecosystems are generally similar. On the right is a time series Anita generated using Matplot, which displays surface soil moisture levels from 2015 to 2022. This is a time lapse of the average soil moisture levels every month in Australia from 2018 to 2021. Through this visualization, I concluded that flooding season in the northern areas of Australia tend to be during the beginning months of the year, especially February and March, whereas southern regions of Australia experience increased flooding in the later months of the year, July and August. Through this time lapse, I also discovered that over the past six years, flooding may have worsened as soil moisture levels have increased. And because of those higher soil moisture levels in recent years, I was curious to check out the surface soil moisture anomalies, or SSMA for short. Darker regions on these time lapses show that moisture levels are further from the mean soil moisture at that date. And as you can see, the number of drastic anomalies in soil moisture has significantly increased since 2018. After calculating the ecoregions with the greatest burned area and evaluating relevant climate conditions, we came to the conclusion that these particular areas featured on the map are at risk for long-term wildfire exposure. If Texas or Australia were to allocate resources for wildfire prevention, we believe it would be highly beneficial for them to focus on these locations. We also wanted to create a tool that individuals and communities could use to assess flood risk in their own communities. Here, you can see flood risk maps that we created based on two significant parameters contributing to flood severity, including soil moisture and precipitation. These maps also feature areas that have been flooded in the past, giving users an idea of historical flooding and how those areas could be affected in the near future. As for next steps, we hope to analyze other factors that could affect the extent of flood damage on communities, such as population density and impervious surface cover. Looking into these data sets will allow us to create tools that individuals and scientists can use to plan ahead for natural disasters, preventing and reducing harmful impacts. After generating our final risk maps, I developed a web app using HTML and CSS to highlight our most important findings in a simpler and easier to understand manner for the greater public. We included all the important maps and time series we visualized during the internship, and we included essential background info for our research and you can check it out by scanning this QR code. Our primary challenge was having to bond as a group in such short notice. Coming from different states around the country, we had to quickly learn how to collaborate in order to learn new skills, work through problems, and develop meaningful research as a team. For our project, there was a steep learning curve to understand code for accessing and mapping data using Google Earth Engine. Together, we had to work hard as a team to understand documentation written in JavaScript and translated into Python for use in Google Colab. This made it hard to troubleshoot certain issues we had since most solutions were JavaScript exclusive. However, this experience of working on a challenging topic in a team environment was valuable experience that we can take into the future. Overall, the SEAS internship program is an incredible opportunity for students like us to get hands-on experience in the field of earth science, apply skills we've learned in high school, and gain valuable insight and connections with professionals in the field. The program has had a significant impact on each and every one of us. The life skills and hands-on experience we take away from this program will serve us through college and beyond. We would like to extend a thank you to NASA and the Texas Space Grant Consortium for hosting the SEAS program, the Center for Space Research for providing their facility, 
our amazing mentor, Teresa Howard, for her guidance and expertise throughout the internship, and you, the audience, for attending our presentation. Thank you so much.